All right, Jay, let's shoot this fucker. Oh, that's a line from the film. What film? Well, Mike, we're here to talk about uh, the 1994 film Ed Wood, directed by Tim Burton, starring Johnny Depp and Jeffrey Jones. It's a much different time for all three of those people now. Oh, whoa, whoa, whoa. Ed Wood is one of my favorite films of all time. Uh, I think I've probably seen it 20 times or more. <laughs> Did you see it in the theater? Uh, I didn't see the movie in the theater. This was 1994, but that same year, earlier in that year, I think before I even knew about the movie, was right around the time that I was getting into John Waters. Could you give us some of your political beliefs? Kill everyone now. Condone first degree murder. Advocate cannibalism. Eat shit. Filth are my politics. Filth is my life. Take whatever you like. Ugh. Yes. Uh, renting a lot of his movies, getting really fascinated by him. He's still, I think, one of the most interesting and unique filmmakers ever. Uh, but I read his book Shock Value, which talked about his early days making movies. And so I was reading that, and I had an entire John Waters movie in my brain. The structure of it, uh, and everything, and how it would be paced out of, like, him kind of... the people he met along the way, like Edith Massey and Divine, and then the third act of the movie would be the making of Pink Flamingos. And then I saw Ed Wood, and I said, this is my John Waters movie. It's the exact same structure. The specific details are changed, but it's the exact same thing that I wanted to make about John Waters. And cut, print, we're moving on. That cardboard headstone tipped over. The, this graveyard is obviously phony. Nobody will ever notice that. Filmmaking is not about the tiny details. It's about the big picture. Uh, were you aware of Ed Wood at the time? No. I was not either, because I've heard people were, were talking about this uh, in, because The Disaster Artist is coming out soon, and that's the only other kind of comparable movie to this. Um, yeah. As far as a movie about the making of a bad movie, mm -hmm. uh, another kind of legendarily bad filmmaker. Uh, but I've heard some people say, like, oh, why would anyone want to see The Disaster Artist if they don't know anything about The Room or Tommy Wiseau? And yeah. It's like, well, if it's a good movie, you don't have to be aware of these things. Yeah, no, seeing Ed Wood... Um, I think I was aware of the title, Plan 9 from Outer Space, and sort of that it was like the famous bad movie, but I never seen it, and I, you know, it's yeah. obviously well before my time. But watched Ed Wood, and I'm like, what? <laughs> and then I went and I bought like, I think, I think that it was caught in all the hoopla, so they re-released all of his movies on VHS. I there, think it was like the Angora box set. There was a box set that was covered <laughs> with Angora. I don't think it was real Angora, I think sure. it was just... Pink fur. It was just pink fur. It was polyurethane fur, but uh, it was a gimmick. And they had a little documentary on there called A Look Through Angora, A Life Through Angora. A Look Back in Angora. A Look Back in Angora. Which has not made its way to DVD or anything, but I have a VHS no. copy of it still. I, I don't think it's like a real documentary. I think they just slapped it together. To it's, it's a promotional because it was released through Rhino, Rhino Records or Rhino Productions or whatever they're called. Mm -hmm. And then you get to the end of the, it's like an hour long or something. And then you get to the end and it's... Also available from Rhino Home Video. The Violent Years, Jailbait, Orgy of the Dead, Night of the Ghouls, and Plan 9 from Outer Space. Buy all these Ed Wood movies, also available from Rhino. But it does have a bunch of clips from movies I had never seen before. So. Oh yeah, it's, it's, it was fun to go and watch the real thing after watching the Ed Wood movie. It made you very curious, like, yes. you know, Bride of the Monster, Plan 9, Glen or Glenda, and then you're just like, oh, I want to see what these really were. And then it made you kind of, it sparked your interest in the whole process. It, it just, it was, a, it was one of those like f filmmaker movies, movies that for people that like film. Yeah, well, and people that have made no-budget movies. Sure. I, I don't think we have made a single movie where we have not quoted Ed Wood throughout the process at least a dozen times per day. Yes. <laughs> Ed, we still quote this movie today. And uh, I, I mean, that's part because of Johnny Depp's performance, the way he plays Ed Wood, and we'll get into that, yeah. um, how this movie is not real life. It's not the real story. Right. This is the one. This is the one I'll be remembered for. It's not a truly 100% accurate biographical film about him. It's, it, it has um, 
some theatrics and some drama and some oh, yeah. and comedy that's, to it. And that's something to point out as far as any sort of like biographical movie. You, you always see the people that complain like, well, that didn't happen this way or they changed this, they changed that. And it's like, yes, because it's a movie. Mm -hmm. You should not go into these types of movies expecting a documentary. No. Uh, and this movie in particular, it's it's... I'm almost told from the sort of point of view of a movie made during the era that it takes place. Mm -hmm. All the performances are heightened. I've got incredible news. You got the job. No, I didn't get the job, but something better happened. Better than not getting the job. Uh, Johnny Depp especially, but then also like Sarah Jessica Parker. Every, everyone has that sort of gee golly yeah, exterior. Gee, and it's shot in black and white. And it's shot in black and white, which we'll, we should probably get into the cinematography too. But uh, overall, yeah, it's a very heightened, idealized version of this couple years of Ed Wood's life where he befriended and made movies with Bela Lugosi, mm -hmm. who was well past his prime. When is your next picture coming out? I have no next picture. You gotta be joking. A great star like you, you must have dozens of them lined up. Back in the old days, yes. Now no one gives two fucks for the Bela. But yeah, it's an overall excellent film, uh, and it's perfect in its tone. And execution, but but let's let's do a little recap on who Ed Wood is was before we get into the movie because it's a biography. So who is this guy? I don't know. Um, a lot of people probably heard the title Plan Nine from Outer Space. Maybe not much more. You might have thought some weird movie with t uh, Johnny Depp in it. It's in black and white. Uh, a dead man. Right, right. Oh, that's right. Yeah, that was right around that same period. Um, yeah, I don't want to watch that weird stuff. Move <laughs> on with my life. But Ed Wood made what was considered to be the worst film of all time, Plan 9 from Outer Space, which... Which it isn't. It just is says not. The Room is not the worst movie of all time. Troll 2 is not the worst movie of all time. What these movies are, are the most entertainingly bad movies of all time. But it, I mean, in comparison to B-movies, from the, the 50s and 60s, Plan 9 from Outer Space is not like the worst thing ever. No. I mean, there's lots of technical problems and you sure. know, the uh, gravestone falling over. And it doesn't make sense. Day for night stuff, but I, the, we're, we're old pros to bad filmmaking, so yeah. we've seen all this shit before. I mean, if, if Plan 9 from Outer Space was made today, <laughs> it would be really bad. Yeah. It probably got that reputation without warrant. It was probably a big flop, and then everyone kind of... Mm. Well, I think it was Michael Medved, the critic, that kind of revived that movie as being a well-known, like, famous bad movie, because okay. he has a book called, like, The Golden Turkey Awards, yeah. and he awarded it, like, the worst movie of all time. So I think that's where that reputation comes from. Yeah. Um, I mean, the movie certainly was a big flop and just vanished. I think... It says that he sold the rights for a dollar. For three years, Ed was turned down by every Hollywood studio. They didn't want his film, they didn't want his scripts, and they didn't want him. Anxious to make his own money back, J. Edward Reynolds offered to buy out Ed's rights in the film for one dollar. Ed didn't have a choice. So Edward was uh, a guy, he, he fought in World War II as a para paratrooper. He wore ladies' underwear. Uh, he liked to cross-dress. Confidentially, I even paratrooped wearing a brassiere and panties. I'll tell you, I wasn't scared of being killed, but I was terrified of getting wounded and having the medics discover my secret. He was an idealistic, incompetent young man who made terrible movies and then transitioned into terrible 70s porn and <laughs> became an alcoholic and died. And died penniless. And, and married three, four times and loved to dress in women's clothing, but very specifically, he loved Angora. So he made a couple of uh, terrible films prior to his big, big movie, Plan 9 from Outer Space. All right, everybody, let's get set up for scene 112. Yeah, and that's, that's the time frame of the movie Ed Wood, is sort of starting with him making his first movie up until his most famous movie, which yeah. is Plan 9 from Outer Space. Martin Landau won an Oscar for his portrayal as Bela Lugosi, which is amazing. That's the highlight of the film. Yeah. You know which movie of yours I love, Mr. Lugosi? The Invisible Ray. You were great as Karloff's sidekick. Karloff? Fuck you! Karloff does not deserve to smell my shit! Well, the, the heart of the movie is, and it was wise of them to structure the movie around those two kind of meeting and befriending each other and uh, Ed Wood giving him kind of a second boost on life so late in his 
his life and his career. Mm -hmm. And that's really the heart of the movie is that relationship and them helping each other out in, in odd ways because they're both kind of like outcasts and misfits and it's like they need each other. Don't you have any savings? Heavy, I'm obsolete. I have nothing to live for. It's very comedic and it's actually one of those movies that I think it's better on repeat viewings because there's so many, oh, yeah. so many quotable lines. But uh, it does deal with the fact that Bela Lugosi had a drug problem and it does it in a way where it never gets bogged down in that or gets too dramatic. Uh, it just kind of shows it as, it's almost like, because the movie's so like chipper and Ed Wood's so optimistic that when it has these brief moments of, of kind of Bela Lugosi at his lowest, it's almost like a splash of water. Like, mm -hmm. yes, this movie's fun, but real life keeps creeping in to their, their kind of idealized movie uh, romanticism. Oh my goodness, you gave me the willies. You look like that Dracula guy. My name is Bela Lugosi. I wish to commit myself. Well, it's a perfect Tim Burton film. It's Tim Burton's best movie. It's arguably the last great movie. <laughs> Maybe not even arguably. <laughs> I, I, w I would say it ties with Pee-wee's Big Adventure. The stars at night are big and bright. Deep in the heart of Texas. <laughs> Yeah, I, I don't think I've liked a Tim Burton film since. Mm. I kind of like Mars Attacks, which he did after this. Don't run. We are your friends. Yeah, I, I don't think I've seen Mars Attacks since I saw it the first time. So, <laughs> And I, I rewatch Ed Wood every couple years. Yeah, well, there was that period where it's, yeah, uh, Tim Burton was at his height. Johnny Depp, I think this is his best performance. And now he's like a joke. And I guess he's a scumbag. <laughs> he's a scumbag. And he's a, a scumbag. Um, An alleged scumbag. Alleged scumbag. I think it's one of those early... See, the Tim Burton, he had that... that He's got that vision, that the Tim Burton vision. And so those kind of movies, they, they have the Tim Burton stamp on them. They got the look and, and the wackiness. And then this, I think, was the early Johnny Depp, like... I'm, I play weird characters. Yeah. And, and Johnny Depp, he, he, Ed Wood probably didn't talk like that. <laughs> Johnny Depp t turns him into this weird, like, cartoony character, and it's so, like, such a, uh, like, a charming, mesmerizing performance, mm -hmm. and it's, it's so odd. Yeah, well, that, that's, that goes along with all the, because, like we mentioned, everyone's kind of heightened. Yeah. And not only that, but, uh, and I know the, the screenwriters talk about this on their commentary track, but everybody is introduced in, into the movie, kind of throughout the movie, we meet all these characters. Uh, and their introductory scenes are always like so emblematic of who they are. Like mm -hmm. we meet Tor Johnson in the wrestling ring. We mm -hmm. meet Bela Lugosi trying out a coffin. Too constrictive. I can't even fold my arms. Gee, Mr. Lugosi, I've, I've never had any complaints. This is before. the most uncomfortable coffin I've ever been in. Vampira is hosting her show, and so it's like it's it's very fairy tale like. Yeah. Like you're going along yeah. this path, and you meet all these characters it's, along the way. It's, it's like the Wizard of Oz. It's the Wizard of Oz, which is funny um, because. I've read Johnny Depp kind of based his performance on uh, Ronald Reagan and the Tin Man from The Wizard of Oz. Okay. <laughs> really? Worst film you ever saw? Well, my next one will be better. My next one will be better. Yeah. Not the, <laughs> the, the, yeah, it's a piece of shit. You got Mike Starr screaming on him on the phone. Nobody wants to see this piece of shit. Hey, you can't talk that way about my movie. Your movie? I wish it was your movie. I wish I hadn't blown every dime I ever made into making this stink bomb. And if I ever see you again, I'll kill you. Mike Stars, everybody's great in this movie and they're all so specific. Yeah. Like everybody's memorable and, and specific yeah. in their the yeah, type Yeah, you of remember role. even the, the small performances. Mike Starr is the sleazy movie producer. I, 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 want, I need a drag queen picture. <laughs> and, uh, it ain't gonna be the Christine Jorgensen story no more. Goddamn variety. I had to print the story before I got the rights. Now that bitch is asking for the sky. Is there a script? Fuck no. But there's a poster. It opens in nine weeks in Tulsa. It's like all those wonderful, wonderful little moments. And then, but, but my point was, was this was that, that golden little moment when Tim Burton still had the Burton-esque look. Cause there's, there's moments where like Tim Burton has to put in his his style, yeah. and and the moment that sticks out to me is when um, when Edward and his girlfriend after Sarah Jessica Parker, which is Patricia Arquette, 
uh, they go in a little haunted fun house, mm -hmm. you know, and so you got all the little Tim Burton-y things. But then you have, so you have the early Johnny Depp, goofy, I'm playing wacky character, and then Tim Burton. And then it's like after that. Then both of them pushed it too far. Pushed it, and then you get, you get that, that big pile of dog crap, Charlie <laughs> in the Chocolate Factory, <laughs> um, Alice in Wonderland, and then it's, no, no, yeah. no, I'm done, I'm well, done. Everything was pushed too far, like Tim Burton's style uh, started to overtake the movies. Yes. Like, like this movie has a lot of heart. Uh, yes. Edward Scissorhands has a lot of heart. That's another and, good one. And they're they're all all of his movies, and I guess they still kind of are, but they're all about like misfits and weirdos and outcasts. But this is where the the his style elevated the story, as opposed to his later movies, where it's just like a pile of puke visually. I, yeah. I think his Alice in Wonderland may be the ugliest movie I've ever seen. And this movie. Uh, the cinematography, black and white. I, I, when I think of Tim Burton, I think of his creative visuals, but not so much his cinematography. But like the the way this movie is lit is so it's so rich, and there's so many like there's the scene where Bella Lugosi has to get in the puddle of water with the rubber octopus, and in the background there's all these car headlights shining on him, and it, it like from a cinematography standpoint, it's it's gorgeous, but it's also makes sense in the story and where you're like, oh, that's how they're lighting the scene. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, cer certain scenes look kind of Hollywood and, and flat and certain scenes are very rich. And, and I always think of that scene when they're they're reading the reviews of Edward's stage play. Oh, and they're yeah. All in the little it's very booth. moody, noir yeah, lighting. noir. Hey, it's not that bad. You can't concentrate on the negative. Look, he's got some nice things to say here. The soldier's costumes are very realistic. That's positive. Grave of the century. Well, I've seen a lot worse reviews. I've seen reviews where they didn't even mention the costumes. But then you have like the scenes in the apartment with him and Sarah Jessica Parker, and it, and then those are recreated for Glenn or Glenda, and yeah. it, it's sort of it, it looks like Ozzy and Harriet like TV show, <laughs> and then it's just it's just all around. It's a perfect blend of Tim Burton's creativity, Tim Burton highlighting a specific character, giving him heart and creating this little universe. Yeah, well, and it's, it's. I mean, the movie's about the kind of transformative magic of movies. Mm -hmm. uh, it may, I mean, the movie ends on a very sort of sweet, romantic moment. Let's get married. Huh? Right now, let's go to Vegas. But Eddie, it's pouring and the car top is stuck. Boy, it's only a five hour drive and it'll probably stop by the time we get to the desert. Heck, it'll probably stop by the time we get around the corner. It's the premiere of Plan 9, and they're outside in the rain, and he's like, let's go get married right now. And that's the, the music swells. It has a Hollywood ending. It has a Hollywood ending, and then it, it pans up to the sky, and then we get the postscript. It's like, Ed Wood died penniless alcoholic. <laughs> and it's like, there's the reality creeping in. Just like the reality creeps in a little bit with the Bella Lugosi stuff. I see the usual gang of misfits and dope addicts are here. Janet? It's funny that the closest thing we have to villains in this movie are the normal people that are very rational and, and just trying to point out to Ed Wood that his filmmaking is terrible. That's true, that's true. Sarah Jessica Parker, who I never really cared much for, but I love her in this movie because she's so just matter of fact. You people are insane! You're wasting your life making shit! Nobody cares! These movies are terrible! These movies are terrible. These movies are terrible. <laughs> and she storms out, and she's right. Yeah. But from the perspective of the movie, you know, she's sort of the mean outsider, even though she's the realistic, rational yeah. person. Yeah. And she's she's annoyed when uh, she doesn't get the big big role, and or the girl who who Edward thought was paying for the movie got the lead role, and so Sarah Jessica Parker's naturally upset. Yeah. I am sorry. What did you want me to say? You were supposed to say no. I wrote that part for my girlfriend, Dolores! There are plenty of other parts. Like what? The secretary, the file clerk. Ah! Um, and then you have that wonderful scene when the studio executives screen Glenn or Glenda. <laughs> and <laughs> they think it's a joke. The title of this can only be labeled is this an actual movie? Can't be. They think it's a prank. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, that's that's just wonderful. <laughs> this is probably another one of Billy Weldon's practical he jokes. He the street dressed in the clothes he so much desires to wear. <laughs> but only if he really appears female. <laughs> oh, God. 
I think it's a funny movie anyway, but if you've ever made a no-budget movie, yeah, yeah. it's so relatable and yeah. funny in that respect, too. Um, yeah, I could probably name ten quotes from this movie that we say almost on a daily basis. I have five days to complete this picture. Don't get goofy on me. Cops! We don't have a permit. Run! Oh. Uh. Ah. Bella. I have 25 scenes to shoot tonight. Yeah, and then he's filming Glenn or Glenda, and the, the, the scene is he looks in the store window and kind of like walks <laughs> away. Print that, let's move on. Don't you want a second take for protection? What's to protect? It was perfect. Come on. But you have this like this wacky cast and crew that are just there. They're all there working, trying to help Ed Wood achieve his dream. Each character is, is unique and has their own little little thing. Bill Murray. Now the good news is you're probably going to get hired because you look like Peggy Lee. But I don't want anybody else to resent that. During one of the low points of Bill Murray's career, wasn't this around the time he was doing like that elephant movie? Please don't sit down! Please! No! Don't sit down! Stand up! You can sit down in the car! This was like that low before the kind of Wes Anderson movies revived okay. him. Before, yeah. Where he was doing like tear, the, the man who knew too little. I like his character a lot too because he's... For a movie that came out in the early 90s, it's so, like, accepting and not, like, punching down on these characters of, like, Ed Wood, you know, dressing in women's clothing. It, it, yeah. There, there's jokes, but it's never, it never feels like it's at his expense. No, no, yeah. And same with the, the bunny is uh, the... Bunny Bill, Breckenridge. Bunny Breckenridge is the Bill Murray character. And the, the humor does not, he wants to, you know, get a sex change, but the humor doesn't come from that. It comes from him just being so like open about it yeah. in the 50s there's right. the part when they're at the the wrestling match for tor johnson's mm -hmm. wrestling they're going to take out my organs and make me a woman are you serious it's something i've wanted to do for a long time but it wasn't until i saw your movie that i realized i have to take action goodbye penis Please keep it down. And then, of course, the famous Bill Murray moment when he's getting baptized. They they have a like a Christian pastor who's going to finance their film. Yeah, but which that's that really happened too. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, w w whether or not the baptismal scene occurred, I don't know. But um, they're all getting baptized, and you know, obviously, uh, Bunny Breckenridge is not going to be a, a, a evangelical Christian. <laughs> um, Do you reject Satan and all his evils? Sure. It's just so perfectly delivered. It's yeah. so like like poignant and, and it's telling. Mr. Bunny, what's wrong? I heard you would be coming a lady. Tor Johnson. <laughs> now do my toes. Do my toes. Talk about perfect casting. You have Tor Johnson, who is a real life wrestler. Then you have George the Animal Steel, who is also a real life wrestler. Who looks just fucking like him. It's amazing. It's it's really, yeah, the perfect, he's not even an actor or whatever, the perfect person at the perfect time when that movie was being made. Yeah, and that's, a, that's another very good example of taking reality and tweaking it. I'm a movie director. Goofies, like the Mickey Mouse? Sure. Tor, Tor Johnson was not a monosyllabic ape. Yes, yes. <laughs> he sounded like a normal guy, but in this movie, they, they altered his voice. <laughs> Do my toes. Quite a specimen, and you're going to be in the picture. Yeah, I play Lobo. And then, and then while he is like, "You go over there," <laughs> and then it, 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 they're just perfect, perfect cut print. Fine mess like this, I'll frighten anyone. You have one of the boys uh, take the guy and the girl back to town. You take charge. What you give him all the lines for? He's unintelligible. Look, Lugosi's dead, and Vampiro won't talk. I had to give somebody the dialogue. Well, it's also with Ed Wood, comparing it to, the, obviously, a disaster artist we have not seen yet, but I've read the book and we're familiar with Tommy Wiseau. It's a different situation where with that, it's all just these kind of, it's you know, wannabe actors, just normal people, and then you have this weird man at the yeah. center of it. Yeah. And, and Ed Wood, that's why I think of John Waters, too, where it's like, it's it's not just one bizarre man who makes terrible things. Yeah. It's, it's this whole cast of, of wacky people that all kind of believe in the same dream too, no matter how terrible the vision is. Except for the crusty old cameraman. Oh, yeah. And cut. Perfect. Print it. Let's move on. Don't you want to do another take, Ed? Looks like Big Baldy had a little trouble getting through the door. No, it's fine. It's real. 
You know, in actuality, Lobo would have to struggle with that problem every day. Uh, yeah, there's a, yeah, there's like a meta joke there where they're like, it, the film's obviously in black and white. And they're yeah. Like, do you like the red or the green one? He's like, oh. which one is the red one? What do you mean? I mean, I can't see the difference. I'm colorblind. But I kind of like the dark gray one. And it also, it, it, you don't have to have seen Ed Wood movies to enjoy Ed Wood. But if you do, I, I think it elevates his actual movies. Kind of like uh, if you watch Best Worst Movie and then you watch Troll 2 after that, it changes your perspective of that movie. Yeah. And it, and it elevates it. So it's, it's, it works as a good companion piece where, where each, each uh, aspect of it is kind of propped up by the other. Yeah, it, 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 it does. I mean, I, I think I partially agree. Because like you, you watch Ed Wood and it's so fairy tale like, and it's so like like that moment when they're like the two pilots come in, like we're airline pilots, so where's the set? And then <laughs> behind them, they push the set together and they You're turn. Standing in it, Mr. Wood. Where's the cockpit set? You're standing in it. Place it. And then the real movies, it's just like uh, endless scenes, and you appreciate them more, but. You know that the Tim Burton version, that's not how things happened in real life. It, right. It, but it takes the elements and, and makes them into something, something really clever and, and enjoyable and, and fun. I think my, the point I'm trying to make is that making a B movie in real life was probably a terrible, miserable nightmare. Edward was probably stressed out. Um, you know, obviously they had production problems. And, but, but translating that into this, like, this ragtag group of outsiders having this fun little adventure making a movie. It's fun to watch them like struggle and kind of start from nothing from the terrible play <laughs> where Sarah Jessica Parker comes down on the, the ropes. Yeah. And there's like two people in the theater. And there's they, like a bucket that's water a dripping into. Dripping water. <laughs> and, uh, it's it's all those details. It's it's so perfect. And then they they get the they get the movie, and then they move their way up. Well, the Hollywood happy ending is Edward finishing the worst movie of all time. So there's that twist to it. So th this this takes real life and turns it into magical art. Right. And and it works as its own thing. Like I would I think I would like to see an uh, like a straight laced Ed Wood documentary. I mean, no one cares anymore, unfortunately. <laughs> I'd, you and I would be the only ones watching it. But um, just like, uh, you'd be hard pressed to find people that are still alive to interview. Well, that, that look back in Angora documentary that does have interviews with like Kathy Wood and Conrad Brooks, some of his usuals are in there. Um, but it's such a fluff piece, yeah. that whole thing. Because I think there's, a, there's one shot where Ed Wood's like, he's like, naked and rolling around with like bimbo. He's, he's yeah, he's, he's like drunk snort, and stumbling down cocaine. a hallway. Yeah, and you're like, Ugh, and it's, it's like, that's the reality yeah. of where yeah. Ed Wood's life was. Yeah, it kind of makes you like, after the Hollywood ending of Ed Wood, yeah. it makes you like, oh, that's where he ended up. And it's, it's nice that they didn't. They can make a sequel now, and Johnny Depp could still play the part of a pathetic drunk. He's someone I consider a great friend, somebody. Uh... There's one thing we didn't mention, Jay. This is the movie that called Sarah Jessica Parker a horse. Do I really have a face like a horse? This is where it comes from, ladies and gentlemen. That had to come up, that line, after she was cast, right? I, I gotta give her a lot of props for doing that line. <laughs> That's where it's from, kids. <laughs> we didn't say that shit. That came straight from the horse's mouth.